Let's talk about prop firms because you're here, multi-million in funding, multi-million in payouts. What is the secret, man? <laughs> um. What is going on, guys? Welcome back to another SFT podcast. Today, I'm joined by my co-host, Kyle, aka JCap. He is our first ever affiliate. And also, we are joined by our special guest, Pasquale. Now, if you think my results are astonishing, if you think Kyle, Mr. AK, Mr. JCap, almost at a million dollars in payout is astonishing, wait till you hear about Pasquale, who is above $2.5 million in profit from withdrawals. So, Pasquale, welcome. And hey. Thanks, yeah. so, buddy. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Thanks for hopping on, man. This is like crazy yeah. being in front of a legend. Like, people look up to us, but like, we're nowhere near your level. So, well, you're getting there. <laughs> True. So we'll just do a quick introduction. So maybe how long have you been trading for? Your age? How'd you get into trading? Sure, sure. Um, I'm 35, trading for around 15 years now. Um, got into trading through an ad, like on Michoro. <laughs> That's the start, yeah. So when you first started trading, was it through an unregulated broker or? No, no. just a regulated broker, like re the usual. Just normal regulated uh, retail brokers. And what age was that when you started trading? Around 20. Around 20. Yeah. So Between. did you go full-time to trading at 20 years old, or did you have a job and we were maintaining all of that? Well, it was uh, basically between school and, high, uh, and, and college. So uh, no real job, just waiting for college. Oh, and, oh wow. Uh, well, but uh, was quite successful from the start. So I directly knew that yeah, that's, that's my job, that's my passion. What were you trading? Like, what broker were you using? Well, you... at first, eToro. Okay. Then I switched to Alpari. When Alpari went down with the Swiss, na uh, Swiss uh, National D Bank. D-pegging? Yeah, yeah, yeah. D-pegging. Um, I switched to IC Markets and pretty much stayed with them. Okay. So how much capital did you start with in college? Because I can imagine. $50, $100. These and then, were my first accounts, yeah. And then did you, you said you reached success early on. So did you flip that account? No, nah, no. To a million. It was just, uh, <laughs> would be nice, would be nice. It'd be nice. But uh, yeah, reality, like uh, many traders are blowing the first accounts, like 10 accounts probably. But uh, in the end, um, I found success pretty early on, like uh, with when I put the first bigger money for, for 20 year old, like 500 bucks. Oh, okay. Uh, college students, yeah. Um, I flipped it at 2000 to 2000 and then made a smart choice, uh, withdraw half of the, the money, um, to be sure. Yeah. Okay. And then, so your first success was $2,000. So then were you still doing college? Like $2,000 is not enough for, no. to sustain yourself. So how did no, it go no. from there? Well, uh, in Germany, we have a different, different system. So we, we don't pay that much for college. It's free. Okay. And, uh, um, so I could trade without without uh, any anything to to really have to fund myself. Like um, I just traded to to trade, yeah, to be to get better, to make an income maybe in the future. But uh, for that time, like um, I just traded, and yeah. You just traded, but where were you learning from? Because I could imagine 15 years ago there isn't really much resources to learn from. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There were like a few forums. Like to begin with, um, like baby pips was, mm -hmm. a, was a thing where you can actually learn, yeah, what is a spread, what is take profit, all that kind of stuff. But yeah. it doesn't go deep. It's just... They still just, have the course. It's like very surface level. But it is still yeah. good to go through the course because it's uh, structured in a way where it's like, you know, progress bars. You kind of understand what the Forex markets are and stuff. And then I think there was like trade to win, right? Were you ever on that platform or no? I think no. trade to win was more equities and futures yeah no uh, no no forex factory right obviously yeah forex factory is a big thing mm -hmm. so i've been around since forex factory right like i was in the trading systems thread and and um there was a bunch of there, there there still is a bunch of retail systems in there like what was your experience going through that and what did you take away from it because i found you know learning through a platform that's not like youtube where somebody and even something like this a podcast where you can talk to somebody and actually have that interaction like what was your experience with that well uh with uh, forex factory there it's um a normal forum like a uh, different forum for for any forex pair mainly urc was was the most active one obviously so i basically just looked at that 
Mm -hmm. And um, the people in there, they were good traders, like for the time, uh, much different from now, because at that time, because of there was no YouTube or no mentorship, um, people actually had to do, uh, had to put more work into it, so they actually know what's going on in the market. So overall, there was a much higher level, I think, um, on the average trader. And um, at Forex Factory, um, basically everyone benefited from each other because um, everyone saw something different in the market. Everyone shared, um, so you could uh, make up uh, your mind and then added something that, that someone else is posting and that's how you learn and keep learning. Um, you post your mistakes, you post your success stories. You know it. Yeah, You've yeah, been on yeah. The I found it was actually harder for me because the, I guess the information stream was a lot harder to keep up with, you know, because some people are just using that forum as like their personal journal, you know, so like you get a lot of people that are just like posting their own charts and stuff. Uh, like. I guess for me, I guess it hurt my growth because I, I was seeing so many people post their analysis, but then a lot of times you would never see like the outcome of that analysis. So mm -hmm. for me, I guess it, it kind of hindered my growth. Like, what did you resonate most with in that forum? I think you mentioned, you know, maybe it wasn't the trading systems thread. Yeah, I have a look and uh, had a look in, into the trading system as well. But um, I was trading my own system at, at that point and uh, I had the first success with it. So after after the first uh, blown accounts occurred and, and big losses occurred, um, I started to question my, my system and I tried many, many systems, many different ways. EAs was a big, big, big thing there. Like everyone was chasing the next big thing on EAs, um, me as well. So no confidence in, in their own system. I think quite a lot of traders can, um, yeah, we're in the same boat at, uh, at a different stage in, in their trading career. But um, yeah. So, so going back into your journey, you said you finished college and then from then, were you a full-time day trader from, yeah. or did you work a job? No, no. Ever, ever since school, I've been just trading. Oh, wow. Nothing else. So how long did it take you to hit your first six figures? Hmm. And how did you hit that six figures? By flipping accounts? Or? Yeah, basically flipping accounts. And it, it's basically right after college. Even in college, I came very close, um, like over 70K, and uh, blew it in a month, almost, the, the whole account. And then started again, and building, building, building. Um, be more conservative, like you don't want to lose 50% of your account in a month mm. um, on, your f on your own money. Um, and uh, yeah, after one, two years of learning, um, and trying, try and error every time, um, you finally get there. Oh, wow. So Do you think that's like a necessary evil where you have to like go through a couple blown accounts to actually figure out and kind of go through that pain? Because every successful trader that I've talked to, or at least most of them, have gone through that period where they're like really in a deep, deep drawdown or they've blown multiple accounts. Like I've never talked to somebody that's really made it that has a blown account. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's natural. Because uh, markets are violent and uh, market uh, things occur and you don't know about it. Like we talked about the SMB, the yeah. decoupling. Um, nobody knows about it in the, in the, what's, what's happened in the future. So you constantly are um, confronted with new stuff in, in trading. And um, actually the, what, what happens, happens uh, um, after that is, is a new market. So... Um, there are much, uh, many blown accounts uh, from these uh, these uh, uh, things like SMB, mm -hmm. like uh, Brexit. You don't you don't know the outcome of that, and um, well, there's there's nothing to it to uh, not nothing bad to it to to lose to to such events. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't accept the risks of the market. Like they they really. Um they don't, they don't think about the risk that they're taking. Even with, uh, you know, Robinhood, when um, GME was happening, you know, GameStop boom during the pandemic, a lot of people were allowed accounts, like, when, when, so when you're signing up with an options account, where you actually have to give them information and everything, and then they categorize you into, like, is this person a level one options trader or a level two options trader? And then I think it's the level three options traders are allowed to sell 
uh, you know, uncovered contracts. And a lot of people don't know the risk behind that. Like, what do you think of that? Like, do you think there's, there should be more rigorous process of going through that? Because there's unlimited risk when you're selling options. I've never been into options. Okay. Because I, I always traded Forex. So um, I had a look into to stock market, but um, to me, it, it was too manipulative. So if a big player comes in, he can push you out of the market and you don't, you don't know it, you, you just get the loss. Yeah. And that's why I never, never look deeply into that. So do you think like a lot of traders would benefit though, if they really looked at the risk that they're taking in the markets though, like from a real standpoint, I mean, prop is a little different now. And I think it's, it's provided me an opportunity at least to detach from the money a little bit, but at the same time, I want to be mindful of my risk because it does impact you emotionally, whether it's your money or not. Yeah, that's true. Um, but unless you you occurred um, a certain event in, in your trading career, you don't know how to manage a risk because if you're just winning, well, what about risk management? You don't need it. Right. Like, so um, when you when you get your first big loss, you start to think about, well, what's 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 happening here? What's what's wrong? And uh, from that point on, if you're smart, if you're fast, you adapt. Yeah. And uh, but most people, they they don't adapt. They they just think even well, especially if they have a winning at some point, um, they just keep saying to themselves, "Well, I'm the greatest. I keep going." Yeah, they kind of have like tunnel vision on what they want. Uh, they're like chasing money a lot. Um, we talked a little bit about like journaling too. Did you ever really journal? Because for me personally, I've never really journaled or back tested. I, I found them to be exercises that didn't really apply to like the current market. You know, I could always look back and, at hindsight data and stuff and like, I guess, uh, curve fit my strategy to previous data, but it's never going to help me execute on the current market condition. So I always kind of found them to be, you know, they're good at times, but. You know, I don't put too much of an emphasis on it. Yeah, basically, me too. But um, journaling is good for, for people who trade more like technical styles where you can actually um, copy the trades. Like if you um, put it technically, um, you can, uh, yeah, you can always go back and say, okay, um, on journaling, like um, if I do it the same way, is it, uh, are, these, are these results better, are they worse? For me, um, I'm not a technical, technical trader, so journaling isn't, isn't helping me at all because I can't, I can't uh, do the same trade like over and over and over, like, uh, like EMA crosses mm -hmm. or something like that. So journaling doesn't help me at all. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like the global economy situation is like always changing. You have to be, again, versatile to that right yeah talking about journaling like for me the only reason i journal is because i get to look back and see my losing streaks which we all go through right and knowing that i've conquered my previous losing streaks it gives me confidence in the future when i do have my losing streaks that i could do it again so that's what journaling helps me for whereas with back testing i don't really find it as useful at like because i, I like to correlate my pairs as well and with back testing, you don't feel the emotions. You just, you have a clear mind. You're able to see price action. That's why a lot of people, when they back test, they have a high accuracy. But once they're forward testing, once they're trading the price as it is, they end up having the opposite, a very low accuracy. But now let's talk about prop firms because you're here, multi-million in funding, multi-million in payouts. What is the secret, man? <laughs> um, experience, I would say. Just experience. Um, been through a lot on trading, have seen a lot, so I think I can adapt fast in the market. Um, and yeah, that's that's the the biggest thing I think. So, but um, and of course, if you trade a long time, um, if you look at the chart, it just um, it just clicks. So you don't need a, a much time like to analyze any any chart. So um, you're basically into it. Like, especially for me, I'm, I'm focusing on one, one prayer, like gold. So there's not much to, to go outside of, of that market. So just focus, experience with the market. I've done, done it multiple times. So 
that helps a lot, yeah. Yeah, so you're saying experience is the main factor. So when did you start getting to prof firms? Like what year did you discover them and which was the first prof firm? Well, it's FTMO, like for, for most, and 2020 when oh, they wow, actually... Oh, 2020. Yeah, when Recent. they popped off. I, th I think it was a YouTube video of them, one of the first, um, where they explained the prop firm business. And that's where I got into it, yeah. So how do you approach these challenges? Um, well, difference from back then to now is uh, right now I have uh, the money yeah. to, to actually <laughs> do the challenges. Yeah. And um, I can be more strategic about it. Like uh, in the past when I started prop firming, uh, with prop firms, uh, it was like, okay, you, you basically have to, to win the challenge, to, to get funded, to get the money out. And um, nowadays, I have earnings from prop firms. Yeah. So from the company side, like my own company, I can write off the challenge fees. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's basically a trade-off. Yeah. Yep. Um, so you go a little more aggressive now compared yeah. to back then you were conservative. It's the same thing, like if you're putting your entire paycheck, $1,000 into a, a challenge or $500, you want to make sure you take it with low risk, conserve their proper risk management. But if you're aggressive now, so how much do you risk now on a challenge? Well, I, with all prof firms, I, I buy only the, the maximum. Um, Same, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> because in the end, it's, it's not worth the, the time to, yeah. to keep going with 5K accounts. Um, yeah, only the, the top um, accounts. Also, I don't work with prop firms, or mainly prop firms who offer lower account sizes there's a certain rules that i never would would work with like um trailing drawdowns oh, yeah. all <laughs> this kind of yeah, stuff yeah. <laughs> um yeah basically but do you use a trade copier no oh, okay all by hand because okay. prop firms are so different from each other and the approach um to the traders is different mm. so i try to avoid anything that can be done by them yeah. to, to limit me <laughs> oh, okay and yeah. even if they allow eas I don't, I don't use any EA, mm. and even if they allow trade copier, I, I won't use it because um, I have to fear that at some point they say, all right, use an EA, mm. but it's actually a trade copy. Mm. So, so, yeah. I've, so been with, I've been with a lot of firms for a while, though, and for me, like, when I'm paying for the cha challenge, it's like, if I could pass one, why don't I just try and pass two, right? Like, if you have the money, you just, honestly, you could pass as many as you want. If you're going to pass one of them, you could pass an unlimited amount of them. I guess I had a question, too, like, now a lot of firms are going towards no time limit challenges, but we see that the failure rate is still high. Like, what do you think is stopping traders from, I guess, taking their time with things and passing them, I guess, in a more consistent manner? Like, I mean, it's, as always, greed. Mm -hmm. They want to get to the payout. Like, but uh, I think over time, people will be better and uh, will actually take the time to pass the challenges, take it more seriously, um, because uh, actually it, it it's better. It's mm -hmm. better for the success. But um, I think, ex especially with prop firms, you have a lot of young traders, you have a lot of inexperienced traders, so they want to get over the challenge very fast. And I completely understand it. I mean, yeah. I would do the same. But um, to, be, to be realistic, um, to take the time is, is the better approach, definitely. Have you ever tried to get in other markets? Or like, did you start with gold and have just stuck with gold the entire time? Well, it depends on, on prop firms and, and my, my own account that I traded in the past. Um, it's completely different. Mm -hmm. So uh, prop firms is gold only because it's easier to, for me um, to keep track of daily drawdowns, also um, the, the whole slippage uh, theme and so on. So gold is easy for me with prop firms. Like um, when I talk to, uh, about my personal account, um, I trade a uh, four-hour strategy, 25 pairs, prepared on Sunday, oh, um, wow. swing That's trading for the whole week, um, reconsider the trades on Wednesday, maybe reload the trades on Wednesday, closed on Friday. That's yeah. my strategy. So when we were talking on the yacht, you mentioned how you treat prop firms like a game, like the way you trade prop firms is not the way you trade your private capital. So what's the mindset behind that? Well, I wouldn't call it a game. I don't like it, prop firms, <laughs> games, um, because of uh, maybe regulation and gaming industry. So to me, it's not a game. It's a way to, to earn, um, definitely. But um, um, when I come to, to trading with prop firms, um, 
I know from from the past, like and from their model, I think um, I always treat them like if they go on tomorrow, and especially today uh, with what's what's happening in the industry. Maybe I'm right, mm -hmm. maybe I'm wrong in the future, but right now, um, prop firms are not as stable, mm -hmm. I would say. So I take the approach like if they die tomorrow, okay, fine, but um, I want to get the most out of it. If the, if, if the industry does like weather this uh, storm of regulation, where do you see it going in the future? Mm, it has to be more professional, mm -hmm. definitely. So. Um, it has to be thought, thought through, like from, from A to C. Um, contracts has to be professional. The whole look of the program has to be professional from the wording. Um, there can't be any mistake like in the future because now the eye of regulation is on prop firms, um, at least in the US, and they're not here to, to, to just ask they're here to act, um, what it seems like. And um, if they, the prop firms are not carefully, they, they pretty much done. Yeah, like do you think this new influx of prop firms, because there's a lot of prop firms out now, like do you think uh, a lot of them are probably not gonna make it? Yep, definitely. Because um, like the, the trader in the prop business, the, the prop firm owners also lack some experience in my in my uh, um, view, so um, they have to learn fast, I think. They have to take the right steps. Um, and um, there are some firms out there who, who actually do it like the past year or so. They changed a lot. They changed the wording. So we are actually experienced the change already in the past two years. Like if you look at prop firms like in 2021, mm -hmm. um, Basically, Even the rules are changing, right? All the rules yeah. are changing. What do you think is going to separate the ones at the top? Because it seems like it's the race to the bottom where everybody's trying to trim and change these rules to get, I guess, you know, easier conditions or I guess what you would call easier conditions for traders to pass. Like how, how tight do you think that can get? Because <laughs> if you're, you know, if we race to the bottom and now the profit target is only 2%, like now it's not a sustainable no. model. No. I think uh, it it gets harder. It will get harder. Because um, if you see the prop firm model, um, they have to be they have to be in profit themselves. So if, uh, if it gets easier, more people pass, more people get payout. Um, so if you don't want the prop firms to be uh, gone in the next day, um, prop firms has to, be, has to find a solution to sustainability. Mm -hmm. So um, they actually have to use the traders. Um, data like the trades to execute it maybe on the market whatever but um, they they need the the trader to be um, as professional as like he he trades his own money so maybe the rules get harder so the prop firms can actually evaluate the trader more more precise like is he actually um, trading good or is he gambling mm -hmm. that's the difference I think in the future for prop firms so how do you pick which problems to go with? Because there's so many now. Mm. Um, rules, of course. So there are some red flags in rules, like trailing drawdown, it's just yeah. to make you fail. Um, the, the actual challenge, challenges are like the standard challenge, like two-phase, straight up, like um, hidden rules. Are there, is there anything in, in FAQs or something that's maybe considered forbidden. Like it has to be straight up. Mm. Everything has to be straight up. They have to pay out, of course. Mm. They have to be um, in the market for for a while. They have to to have a certain reputation, I think, in the in the industry. And also, I always ha I always look into the the company itself. So I'd like to look um, at the company structure. Do they have um, one firm, like um, do they handle everything inside one firm? Do they have a, a, a hedge fund behind it or mm -hmm. whatever whatever it can be? Um, and actually the, the broker they are working with. 
Of yeah. Course. It sounds like you're asking the right questions and doing your due diligence. Like I myself, we talked about how uh, this one specific firm has a different contract than the rest. They explicitly state things in the contract. You think like more people should try and understand the contracts uh, and the terms that they're signing under because a lot of people you know, may break the rule uh, or they might have a hidden rule and they, then they blow the account and then now all of, all of a sudden they're complaining like it's a scam. Like yeah. it, it does put a, paint a bad picture on the industry, but at the same time, it's a business. So I came from the construction industry and a lot of contractors would get screwed over because they're not reading what's in their contract. And then when they look back, they're like, oh, what's this? You know, it just, it's just in business in general, you have to treat it like a business. A lot of people are treating this like a casino, right? That's correct. That's correct. Uh, but that's not only prop firms, that's trading in general. Yeah. And business in general, right? Yeah. And business. And um, regarding contracts, yeah, I think everybody should read their contracts, of course. But um, regarding rules and, and the drawdown limit, especially because people maybe, yeah, violate the drawdown limit mm -hmm. because of slippage. Um, I think it's it's all combined the same that people should actually know what they are doing in in forex trading and prop firms in general mm -hmm. to understand the rules. Um, they actually have to to care about the the business itself and and have to understand how it works. And and I think there's a, a big um, empty space right now. Like if you if you go on social media, like prop firm related. If, they go, if you go to the discourse of the prop firms, um, basically, I, I would say eight of, of ten people don't really know what they're doing. Like, they're young, inexperienced, mm -hmm. maybe started trading with a prop firm, which is, like, highest risk you can do. Mm -hmm. um, because, um, like, with a normal retail broker, 70% lose money. Yeah. So put up some rules. Not only that, you can yeah. buy these challenges on credit. Right? Yeah. What you can't, a lot of... Uh, you know, a lot of regulated brokerages won't allow you to just deposit money on credit. So I think when I, when I was coming up and trading my personal accounts, I found that I think prop actually accelerated my, my growth curve because now I'm like buying these challenges on credit and blowing my accounts faster. Whereas when I was coming up, I, I actually had to save up that money to deposit into my brokerage account. Right. Yeah. Like, do you think traders have a better opportunity now? Because we talked about spreads and, and slippage, like, you understand what it's like to trade with a three pip average euro spread. Like, do you think traders still have the best opportunity to become profitable now than before, or is it the same? No, no. That's that's the whole prop firm business is about. Like the opportunity for for everyone, especially for younger people who don't have like five k, ten k, who can who they can put into a forex broker account and and make maybe a few hundred bucks out of it. So, um, like n right now, um, I think back then the, the average um, deposit on a normal broker was like $200. Mm -hmm. Deposited into to prop firms, you make out of $200, what is it, like a 50K account, yeah. 10K account, around that. Um, you actually can trade with 50K, yeah. um, make a lot of money out of it. So, the, the opportunity is, is huge. Yeah. If you do it right. So do you think like the argument, because there, there is an argument out there that people state, why don't you just trade personal capital, right? But people don't understand if you have the skill set and you can actually pass a funded challenge, now, it's, now you're trading with 20 times what you put into the challenge, right? There's no way, I don't think there's no, any way that you can take that personal account and try and flip it to 20, 20x and now you're trading with that amount, right? I mean, some people are doing it, right? But it's very unrealistic. Like, do you think the argument is, prop is still the better option compared to personal to me yes that's why i stopped trading personal mm -hmm. like in 2020 when i started with props um i completely focused on drop on, on props because the risk reward is just too high mm -hmm. in general so were you able to make six figures or seven figures with a personal account or was that through prop firms both oh, okay so six figures was like um, back then when i when, when i really traded uh, for for my own living um, um, in my personal account, like 2011, around-ish. Um, and, um, well, the path went along, founded the broker and, and all that kind of stuff. So I traded my whole life there. Um, six, six figures, of course, 
well because I had to support my my <laughs> my career, my 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 life, and mm -hmm. um, with prop firms, um, it became a lot faster, at least um, because well, it's it's a personal account on crack, so yeah. you could say like you have different prop firms. Like I signed up to any prop firms that I considered legit, yeah. and um, out of a sudden I had like around two million on on funded accounts like um and i yeah pretty much um risked it all oh. and yeah that's and basically yeah um i got a bit lucky as well of course <laughs> i mean if you tell someone okay you flip um a few thousand bucks uh dollars um in prop firm accounts and and make six seven figures out of it there's some luck behind it as well of course sure. so it's not just um you can you can do it like every month of course um but as i said like i treat prop firms like they're gone the next day so i put up the risk huh. to do it yeah in the end it worked out yeah so let's talk about the good stuff then like as someone who has made over two million dollars with prop firms what is your strategy like on like trading? technical analysis, yeah. Yeah, um, it's basically just fundamentals and out of experience. Like, I look at the chart, I know what what to do. Like from from the feeling that I get from from price action almost, and I back it up with with some technical things like uh, 50 EMA, uh, 100 EMA, 200 EMA. That's basically all my my indicators. I don't use anything else. <laughs> um, I start, started on, on, on Sunday to, to plan my week ahead, like fundamentally, what, what's coming out on news, um, what trades am I looking at, like do I want to sell or buy on the week, and that's um, how I look on the chart, like from Monday to Friday. So, so do you think there's always going to be room for a discretionary trader? Because, again, there's an argument out there, and a lot of people, I guess, are worried that AI is going to take over markets and then all of a sudden this discretionary trader, this human element is going to just dis disappear. Could be. Could be. Um, I think AI has a big part in the next few years. But um, like, you know, with um, certain technical um, systems, they have the, how you call it, the self, uh, um, like the rules they put up, like, if you have a good system and a lot of people using it, like um, it becomes bad at some point mm -hmm. because like the uh, edge dissipates. Yeah, right. yeah, and same could be said about AI in the future. But I think at the start, with any good system, they they're gonna take off. So you seem like a little bit skeptical, but also um, you know questioning the future. What are you really doing with the prop firm payouts? You know, because I'm always thinking about diversification. Like, are you starting to fund a personal account again? Or are you getting into real estate? Like, what's the next move to, yeah. to I guess, protect yourself just in case something does happen? Mm, basically, you said it, diversification. Um, I don't trade any um, um, own account anymore, like just prop firm. Take the, the income of prop firms and um, just go into stocks, mm. crypto. I'm a big crypto fan. Um, yeah, that kind of stuff, like long-term, only long-term. Okay. Yes, so going back into your strategy, I heard you say you use indicators, and as an ICT <laughs> trader, and I'm sure many of the audience are ICT traders, we're pretty shocked. So I'm guessing you don't trade ICT strategy, or what's your thoughts on ICT? Um, I had a look into it, but it's just not for me, because um, I stopped in 2018 to, to adapt new systems to mine, um, because I realized, like, the more I, I try, the worse I get. So yeah. mm -hmm. after that, it went pretty well for me. So ICT mm, or any other strategy can work. Like, you have the person behind it, um, and you have to execute the trade. Like, good question is, what would you rather do? The best trader in the world with a mediocre strategy or a completely shit trader with the best strategy. <laughs> what do you think who is, who is yeah. gonna do it best? 
the more skilled trader. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because you can have the best strategy if you can't execute it, you're done. So what was like the biggest turning point in your career as a trader? Because we both talked about it. Uh, there's always that search for the Holy Grail. There's always people out there that say, uh, my system's not good enough. Let me go search for the next best, next best thing and keep trying to add to my system. And they're not really focusing on the system that they have. Like, what was your biggest turning point, I guess? Yeah, basically, like I said, um, 2018, when I started looking for other systems. Like, when I had trust in my system, when I refined it over the years, like, I was comfortable with it. Like, I don't, I don't have to copy anyone else. I don't have to, to uh, use anyone else's strategy because I will never see the market through the eyes of, of the person who actually came up with the system. And um, I always will execute it worse. And for, for my strategy, um, I can't, tra I, I can't trade uh, trend following strategies, for example. So my, my heart always search for, for some uh, reversal patterns. Mm -hmm. Like I look at the chart and all I do is look for reversal patterns. Um, so you can give me the, the best um, trend following system. I can't, can't execute it like, mm -hmm. like a good trend follower um, would do it. Yeah, that's, do you think people just get bored of what they're doing, even if it's working and they're trying to like fix it? I don't know, not for me. Because um, every, every trade is different, every day is tr different. But uh, I think it's because how I trade. Like, mm -hmm. it's not technical. It's not just plain, okay, I look at the chart. It's more like a fluent system where I look at price action, what is actually happening right out there. Like, when, when someone asks me what I do for a living, I basically say, I'm a macroeconomist. Mm. <laughs> I tell them I buy and sell stuff online. All right, so you're saying that you're a macroeconomist, so fundamentals play a huge part. So for someone like me who doesn't really use fundamentals, how can I get into fundamentals? And do you think it will help me in my trading? Or do you think I should just stick to my strategy? Well, first of all, stick to your strategy, like always. But um, if there are certain layers you can add to your strategy in the long term, like you have to try. And um, um, especially with fundamentals, they can provide a layer to any strategy because if you, if you say, okay, I'm pure technical. Um, technical analysis is, is a thing of looking at the chart like it was in the past. Like you, you can predict the future with technical analysis because um, the, the future isn't in the chart. Like uh, the future is in, in systems of, of banks, of big traders, whatever. Um, they, the, well, the whole mechanic in the market, what um, influences the market from the outside. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's the fundamental analysis. Like, um, and a good start is um, um, rate hikes, all the rate, rate stuff, um, um, NFPs, all that kind of stuff that, that's obvious. It's really market sentiment, right? Yeah. Like you can't get that in a backtesting model unless you were living during that period, right? Correct, the correct. fear, greed cycles, it all ties into where the markets are going. Correct. And for a starting point, like understanding like the rate cycles, how they work, and, and what's, what's attached to it, like mm -hmm. how banks would react if, if um, surprises happen, especially. Um, and that's long term. Like if, if there's a, a sudden rate hike, like that nobody expects. Um, it has impact on a market like for weeks, because um, of course there's an initial reaction, but um, the impact is, is broader if, yeah. it's, if it's not uh, expected. Do you think at the end of the day we're really just like sophisticated gamblers? <laughs> yeah, to some extent, mm -hmm. of course, because uh, we are retail traders, we don't know anything. Um, we we have no power in the market, and um, we are at the very, very end of, mm -hmm. of the tail. People say we're at the mercy of the markets, right? Yeah. Um, and I think Mark D Douglas had mentioned, you know, it only takes one trader to uh, invalidate your idea, right? So accepting the risk, essentially, on every given trade. Do you, do you look at, like, your trades? I always look at my trades as every single trade that I place. I think Ed Seikota 
actually mentioned this. Like every every day that I come to the market, I assume the position that I have is wrong. Okay. Do you do you think that way? Do you like when you put risk on? Do you assume like you're are you gonna lose that money? No. No. Never. Okay, so you're really so confident in in your if, analysis and everything. If I had that approach, I wouldn't open the trade at the first mm, place. Mm. So, um, but um, emotionally, the attachment on trades is is a big thing um, for many traders, and um, for me, I I don't care about my trade. Yeah. Like, so, like openly. on a day to day basis, how would you? rate like your level of excitement in the markets because it's very much portrayed as like this fast exciting thing and i think what people re you know don't really realize is a lot of professional traders are just stuck in a very boring uh process oriented routine yeah um i i don't get excited about trades like win or lose like um i can be on the telephone and lose like a big trade 10k <laughs> And still talk about something else like it's it's not that big yeah. like and um, I think if if someone has has the fear um, to let the trade alone like like you can sleep or whatever um, then that's the 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 sign that you risk too much mm -hmm. so you have to turn out your risk um, so that to the point where you don't care about your trade so you you fire and forget like. Um, especially on technical trades. Just to add on, that's one thing I noticed about all the profitable, consistently profitable traders is that they're emotionally detached from the markets. That's why I always say, if you're starting off trading, make sure you're not a full-time broke day trader because then you're attached to the markets, like your trade needs to hit your TP. So I always advise having some source of income. Whereas for us, now we're in a position where even if we lose the next trade, we're still fine. So that's why we're not emotionally attached to the trade. But one thing that you mentioned was that you're not really when you get when you get into a market you expect it to to be a winner so what's your accuracy looking like well with prop firms on gold trades because i, I risk my i risk um much more the whole account yeah <laughs> <The whole> margin <laughs> basically but um it i think it's around it depends on on the market cycle it's around 55 to 65 percent accuracy um but um the winning trades are much bigger than the losing trades yeah, usually sure. so the uh, risk reward is higher yeah. Yeah. yeah i heard you mention you trade forex as well so why are you only trading gold with prop firms um it's easier to keep track um for, for to one pair because uh, if i implemented my my own system to to that kind of stuff i as i said i i may open like 12 15 trades on sunday evening at like european time sunday mm -hmm. evening um, and um, the drawdown limits would would not not be enough. Mm -hmm. Like I tested it, it it doesn't work with with prop firms. So I changed my system, went into gold, which is like high volume, high movement. So um, and that's the goal of of my approach to prop firm. Like I said, like get the most out of it in the shortest amount of time, um, and that for me is gold. A lot of people using um, indices um, mm -hmm. who are similar to that um, in, in a kind, but um, yeah, for so, me it's gold. So how many trades are you taking in a week then? Well, it actually depends again on the market, but um, you can say on average maybe one a day, so oh. not very much. Okay, not very much, one a day not very much, yeah, okay. Still pretty fr yeah. frequent, I guess, in my yeah. opinion. At least for me, I usually try and aim for like two to three. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let's so let's start wrapping this up. Um, you wanna ask, ask, ask some like rapid fire questions? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I guess if you yeah, if you had any advice for uh, you know people people watching this, what would you what would you recommend? Keep it slow. Slow it down. Um, I guess with the problem space, how can someone just like majority of our audience is not really at the level like they want to hit their first six figures? What would, what would you advise to, to them? Well. Six figures and more. Like they want, like if they want to hit their first six figures, what is the best route when it comes to trading to hit that goal? Yeah. Let's say first profit. First yeah. profit. Yeah, yeah. Because there's a lot of people well, that don't make. Have a profit. have a very good understanding on what you're doing on a market. Um, have a winning strategy and maybe risk a little more. So would you recommend profit from over personal account? Yeah, that's what I made the change um, to profit from only. So yeah, 
of course. I don't have anything else. You know, if you if you want to add ask, anything. I'll ask one last question. Okay. So, what is your favorite trading psychology book? Hmm. Never read one. Wow. Oh. So you never um, digested any of Turn Mark Douglas's. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you haven't digested any of Mark Douglas's content. No. Uh, what about any trading books in general? Because when we when we talked about. Uh, sticking to one market, like I've read uh, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, and this was before a time when, this is before electronic trading, and uh, have you have you ever heard of it? No. Uh, so Jesse Livermore, he was like very famous back in like, I think the 1800s, he would just corner one market at a time, like he wasn't trying to trade all these different markets, so he started out in plywood, and then he went to coffee and then soybeans, like would you recommend people to just focus on one specific market and learn that market, or would you try and tell them to just maybe try and focus on a little bit of everything and then build like a broad watch list. Depends on, on the trading style. I mean, uh, for me, it's it's gold only, but um, if you're more a technical trader, like I did on, on my personal account, it made more sense to, to spread out the risk on 25 pairs and, okay. and, and lower the risk per trade, mm. of course. So it depends on- It's more on, diversified right that way. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess we'll end it. It's very interesting to see how, like, majority of what we what you said, like, we always say it as well. And is there any last words? Um, I guess thank you for having me. Yeah, man, it was yeah. a pleasure meeting you. I, I've never really <laughs> met anybody man. that's, I guess, been through kind of the same process as me. You know, somebody that's traded when it was three pip euro spreads and Forex <laughs> Factory. It was a nightmare back then. I mean, I think a lot of people have so much information available at their fingertips. There's really no need or there's really uh, no reason for that people should be struggling as much as they are. You know, you really have to look at yourself and figure out, you know, what's really holding me back at the end of the day. Yeah. But pleasure meeting you. You know, I'm, I'm sure we're going to meet again in the future. Yeah. I mean, these guys have 10 plus years of experience and they're at the point zero 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 one percent So it goes to show, guys, trading, you're not going to get, you're not going to get rich quick in trading. It takes a long time. It takes a lot of experience, a lot of stress. But thank you for helping on, Pasquala, and catch you guys next time.